ओके वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू दिस टॉप ऑन कबीर कैन वी गो बैक टू द पोस्टर आई जस्ट वांट टू रिकलेक्ट व्हाट वी आर डूइंग नाउ ऑल दिस एक्टिविटी पुटिंग इट ऑल टुगेदर ओ नो दैट्स ओके आई डोंट थिंक यू हैव द पोस्टर इन दिस Oh, you know? Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, oh my God, that's a lot of work. Uh huh. Okay. Now we know the focus. Uh, so, uh, welcome all of you to uh, the talk on Kabir uh, revisiting what is a song, and we have a wonderful speaker, Professor Lina Hess. Um, today, with all that is happening uh, in Delhi city. um with the kind of violence that we have seen over the last couple of days uh it is it is oh i'm supposed to use this uh i'm supposed uh <clears throat> it is almost it's a coincidence that we are uh talking about kabir in this climate um and uh, kabir has always been seen as someone uh breaking the div- divisiveness in indian society mostly the religious divides uh, that are there and kabir is often seen as representative of a syncretic culture of a composite culture um so it's very apt that even though it's purely by coincidence that we happen to be having this kabir talk in this climate of violence uh but uh when we uh, approach kabir it's not really uh in terms of a kind of escape from the reality of social contradictions the hindu muslim conflict is real so it's not about finding a space of mysticism finding a space away from uh these social contradictions there is a i think a lot of people quote of course not kabir but on a different register i think there is a quote from khalil gibran uh which a lot of people use about uh, how we should go and meet in that space beyond right and wrong uh well it sounds great to meet beyond right and wrong you know that kind of a space which is like a third space uh but uh but i think uh, uh kabir can also be seen as not just doing that as taking us beyond society and in that zone of this kind of uh, mysticism and ecstasy um uh, and i think linda if you remember last year when we were at malwa uh, with the at uh, prahlad tipanya's uh, ashram and we had this debate also about whether we would think of kabir as just a mystic poet you know uh because you go to rumi uh and then you also maybe this meister eckhart uh, you know another mystic uh and then you draw this entire and then there are other mystics you can talk about bulle shah you can talk about uh, other sufi saints amir khusro in delhi delhi is a center of sufi uh tradition you know we have the hazrat nizamuddin uh, right here um nizamuddin olia um azmer is not very far um so we are in the sufi hub uh, and uh, um so we had this uh, little uh, uh, debate there you know whether we look at uh, kabir as a mystic poet and uh, and 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 there was an interesting thing and and i go back to you know i think tagore did this uh, translation uh, of kabir uh i think it's called 100 songs of kabir maybe that's one of the earliest kind of works on kabir which establishes kabir in the global kind of a, a intellectual scene if i may put it that way recently i met someone who works on spanish literature and she told me that the only kabir available in spanish is a translation of kabir of tagore's 100 songs of kabir so um so so one has to take a call there do you want to think of kabir as a mystic poet who in order to address social strife divisions divisive politics you know 
uh, would define a third space or would you really have Kabir which takes you into the hub of this social conflict and contradictions because you do not want to just withdraw from here but really enter it and really turn it around from within and I think that's where I personally uh, and, and, I, I, and I'm also saying this because I read this essay by Linda, that's my real, because Linda has done a lot of work around Kabir and on Kabir, uh, on the living traditions of Kabir, on, um, on uh, uh, the great singer Kumar Gandharv, um, uh, you know, and all of that. But where I got tickled uh, by your work was on your majestic essay on the Ulad Masi. Because what Kabir is doing is that in the Ulad Masi, you know, as you know, Ulad Masi, where you are like turning everything upside down and around and everything, and without for a moment really withdrawing from society. So there would be verses where Kabir is talking about like real everyday material activity, you know. It could be even like a ritual activity. Um, uh, so, uh, so Kabir takes you back into the real world, um, um, you know. Uh, in, uh, in, a, in a completely unique way. Um, uh, there is this, uh, um, this, uh, this verse where he's talking about Sumiran, you know, about Dhyan. Uh, and he says something like that, I don't know if I can remember. Sumiran ki sudhi yun karo. Yeah, the, the Paniari thing. And uh, the two women are just carrying uh, pots of water on their head. But as they are walking, with that they arrive at a chauraha and from there they will each go to their respective homes. But before parting, they are having their last, uh, you know, whatever local gossip or conversation. And they are doing it with their uh, hands gesticulating like this. And, th and, and they are not focusing on the pots of water on there. They are balancing on the head, but that doesn't mean it's going to fall. So you do not really have to concentrate on the pots of water on the head to really concentrate on it. That kind of a sahaz bhav, you know, that you are concentrating without concentrating, right? And, uh, and, and, and I think Kabir's philosophy is also sometimes called as the sahaz, you know, which, is, which means simple, but which also means that sahaz, which is combination of different elements. That means nothing is left out. So to be simple also means that you are grappling all the constituent elements that constitute a particular condition, you see? So, um, so simple, I don't know when you translate it into English and use the word simple, etymologically I don't think it breaks it down like that. Sahaj. Sahaj, yeah. But in, in Hindi or Sanskrit or whatever, Sahaj when you say, it is a Sahaj there, you know, the, the coming together, the combination. And you pointed this out in your essay, Linda. So, um, uh, so I think that's where Kabir is extremely important. I can't overemphasize it and I know uh, I don't have to convince you about it either. So, um, so we'll listen to um, uh, Linda. Uh, she's worked on Kabir at all kinds of levels. Uh, I was earlier telling her about this chapter, which is a very theoretical chapter she has in her book, Bodies of Song. So from uh, more theoretical levels of engagement to engaging it as a living tradition. And that's why uh, she's titled it Bodies of Song, where the song, which is a sound, you can say it's a vibration, but it's also bodily felt. You know, so, uh, so Linda has really uh, done that kind of work. I met her far away in Malwa, <laughs> um, you know, and I didn't know I'll get her to a slightly sanitized atmosphere of a university auditorium. <laughs> Maybe I have to apologize <laughs> to you for that, but uh, that's the way it is. So, uh, so Linda will speak for uh, maybe 40 minutes or something, so she will give us a, a, a detailed uh, presentation. That's what I have requested her to do. And then uh, we will have uh, a question and answer and discussion. You would prefer the <laughs> discussion rather than question and answer. So uh, over to Linda. Can I think you have to come here a little bit. Can move yeah. closer? Should I come on yeah, that yeah. side of the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can I can, well, yeah. well, I can sit in this one. Yeah. I don't want to sit in front of the screen. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'll sit here yeah. and you sit here. That's right. That's right. No, I, I'll sit down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. What do I have to do? Let me just get it for you. Yeah, just... Just... Uh, 
This is getting recorded. I guess so. Yeah. In India, you know, this uh, gadgets always fail, so, <laughs> so you can. I'm be, hoping. You can rest <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. So uh, I should hold this up. Yeah. Hello, in the yeah. back. Hi. <laughs> so actually, the um, the verse that. Saroj was just referring to about the Panihari carrying the pot on her head and having, uh, but still not breaking the concentration. I just thought I'd bring up the song that he that that this occurs in. So uh, I've been immersed in song for the last many years. You know, um, I started out reading Kabir in texts, um, and then I got the idea that I really wanted to experience that living tradition that's been transmitted by singers ever since the first time that any fud emerged from Kabir's mouth. So was he, uh, did he write, did he write his, uh, his fuds and uh, sakis? Somebody is saying no. So what, how do we have them? Oral tradition, right. And then some people wrote them down, you know. Now we've got books and books of Kabir. So, uh, but a lot of things, a lot of, you know, times people say, Kabir ne kya likha? Ya, Kabir ne esa likha? And then we have to say, well, kuch ni likha, Kabir ne. So this oral tradition has been the, the powerful force that has brought Kabir, and not only Kabir, as you all know, wherever you've grown up, if you're in, uh, in the Hindi-speaking area or any other language where there's this kind of bhakti tradition, it's carried by singers, it's carried by ordinary people. So uh, I wanted to get into that uh, uh, world of song. So I started around uh, the year 2000. I started looking around and trying to find out how to do that. And then, uh, am I okay or is there a problem? Huh? Yeah, kind of. Okay. Yeah, some more gadgets. Please. More gadgets. Can, yeah. Never can have enough gadgets. Um, and then the book that I'm going to kind of summarize for you today uh, came out, oh, you know, four and a half years ago. So that's uh, the book about that experience uh, from 2002 to 2015. But even when the book came out, I haven't stopped. That's why last year the two of us met in a village in Madhya Pradesh and this year again we were both there for the Malva Kabir Yatra. He, this guy turned up. I said, what is a political scientist doing in this Yatra? He's, a, he's an odd political scientist. So anyway, I want to give you the song form of the metaphor that he was just describing. Now you have to excuse me, I actually will sing a few lines, I'm not a good singer. But anyway, I want you to think how much more fun it is if you could sing it. So the song, this song is Yun Hi Man Samjhave. Are Pokat Man Samjhave? Just explain, teach your useless mind like this. Bina Koj Kachu Bhedan Hi Pave. Taru Virita Janam Gamvaya. Ho, soon, and then it goes. This is the take. This is the refrain, and uh, so it goes. Yuhi manasamachave, tare pokata manasamachave, bina koja kacha beda na pave. And then the signals go. Ah, you know, bina koja maraman na hipave. Taru birita janama janama gamvaya ho sunasai ragyani. So that'll get repeated all the way through. But then the verses are what Saroj was talking about. So there's a series of three metaphors. The first one is Jo Natari A Chadhe Balatapar Nataro Dola Pajave. Okay, so it's a little bit different dialect than you. So I like this woman performer acrobat that goes in the villages. She'll climb up on the uh, tightrope, right? While her husband, the Nataro, plays the doll. And then she goes, uh, she goes climbing upward and upward, singing Mangal Geet, singing a song. But 
surata varata melave that is her attention her awareness is always on that rope never so she can do all these things similarly there's the one he was talking about the panihari goes to get get the water puts the pot on her head hale dole bat banave par surata uh, i can't read my own thing bevara melave is that the right word bevara you recognizing it yeah. it's a pot okay so she keeps her attention her her real concentration always on the pot so she can go along singing talking chatting with her friends like that there are two more beautiful metaphors one says like a snake going through the forest licking away the dew on the leaves uh but it has a jewel in its forehead and its attention its concentration is always on that jewel and it would give up its life for that jewel and the final one is the marjiva you know what the marjiva is anybody I learned this only by being among these singers. Marjiva is a name for the pearl diver, somebody who dives in to the ocean. So, like the Marjiva diving into the ocean uh and because of such complete concentration on his or her purpose comes back and retrieves hira lal the the diamonds and rubies from the ocean floor. So, um I I wasn't planning to talk about this particular poem, but since he cited that, I just wanted to tell you that the poetry in the form of song is full of such beautiful imagery. And if you listen to it as song, as it's sung, and if you even hang out long enough to start singing along, you get a very different experience of Kabir than you do when you're in school and they make you memorize some dohas right uh so that's what i did this is a you know he even who kabir was is constructed very differently uh in different social formations uh different moments in history this happens to be a modern painting but i like it and i i lost the reference to who painted it it's a modern painting Of course it shows Kabir uh as a weaver at his loom which he was. Um let's go to the next one. But then a very different oh now we've got the pink again. We've had this little pink infestation on the PowerPoint. <coughs> Maybe it's because Kabir was sort of a pinko we call communist that in America. So he had little tendencies. Anyway, this is the way um he's represented in the kabir panth by where he's been institutionalized and turned into a religion and <clears throat> he's uh, the satguru and the param guru and he's also often considered an avatar and he's sitting there like that um this is the cover of the american edition of the book that i did called bodies of song kabir oral traditions and performative worlds in north india Um and this is have any of you heard of or actually heard this particular singer who's become quite famous his name is Prahlad Singh Tipania Anybody okay yeah somebody has heard him he is often performed in Delhi he's he, he was famous way before this but he did get in 2011 the Padma Shri so that made him even more famous he's a wonderful singer with a tremendous ability to reach out to people and to and to open out the meanings of kabir uh and to sing with a great joy and energy that kind of brings people in uh there's also an indian edition of this book which has a different cover but doesn't have them on the cover so could you do the next one so um i would like to just quickly when did i start is anybody aware of that like have i been going for about 10 minutes now yeah uh I would like to quickly give you an idea of what's in the book. Um there are many directions we could go with this material. So I'd also like to leave it open for you to raise discussion on what interests you. Um we could spend the whole time talking about the the matter that Saroj uh, raised at the beginning about that Kabir is engaged in the real world, he's observing <coughs> society, he's observing communal discord he's also observing uh caste injustice and all kinds of things in real society and he says he's not just a mystic poet he's not just ex- not just about ecstasy 
He's not just telling you to go off to that field, that sort of well-known quoted English version of Rumi. But I, I would like to point out that there, we, I can never seem to get away from this split in discussing Kabir. You either want to talk about his politically potent voice, you know, how he can be a voice uh, of critique of injustice uh, and inequality and exploitation in society, which he can, or he's urging us to, you know, surrender to Guru Bhakti or to go off into ecstasy. You know, people seem to be interested or inclined to go one or the other. And I would, I would suggest that it's more interesting to not have to choose. Uh, in, in the book, there's a lot of, there's interviews with people who only are interested in the political side. You know, they say, like one of my friends in uh, Dewas says, I'm a social and political activist. I will use Kabir to the extent that Kabir, you know, helps the causes that I, of social injustice and equality and so on. Uh, and beyond that, I don't care. You know, I don't care what his religious interests are. I will use Mirabai, I'll use Tulsidas, I'll use anybody who advances uh, my deep commitment to work for the good of, the benefit of all people in society. I don't mind him, that, him saying that, but I would like to suggest to you to consider that it's possible to embrace both of these aspects of Kabir, and that actually they enrich each other, and that if you're really engaged in social justice work, if you're really, you know, like we, you just lent your car to, a half hour ago to somebody who was going to Northeast Delhi to bring relief things, if you're really engaged in that, it's very difficult and draining and exhausting work sometimes. Well, maybe it's good for us who are engaged in such work to also be able to experience the joy of Kabir's songs, the ability to really let ourselves experience that joy and that bliss and that ecstasy. It's not that you have to stay away from society forever to have that. I found that in, in living with these uh, singers and in living with the multiple, rich, multi-layered meanings of Kabir. So I, I uh, urge you to be conscious of this uh, inclination to bifurcate Kabir. You know, either I'm interested in political and I'm sort of a Marxist and I'm really allergic to religion, so don't talk to me about Anhad Nad, don't talk to me about Guru and Sadguru, I really don't want to hear about that. Or on the other hand, those who only want to go inward. Think about how they can talk to each other. So these are the chapters, okay? Let's see if I can fairly briefly give you an idea of what's inside of them. Uh, so when I first came, I came to Delhi in the, it was either December 90, 1999 or January 2000, just as we were about to have the new year. And I came to some knowledgeable people in Delhi that I knew, like Ashok Vajpay. And I said, you know, I want to study oral traditions of Kabir. I want to meet singers. What should I do? Where should I go? All of North India was available, right? And this was a sentence that was said to me by multiple people. You must meet Prahladji. Even then, even 1999, 2000, he was well known as a kind of brilliant and, um, I don't know, infectious singer who created a, a great, great experiences in his audiences. So I said, okay, where is he? Oh, he's in a small village in, uh, in uh, Malwa, Madhya Pradesh, sort of near Ujjain and Devas. So I went out there and I had one afternoon with him and his monthly. Uh, well, first they sent me to Bhopal, actually. There was, in Bhopal, there was an institution called uh, uh, Adivasi Lok Kala Parishad that was run by a very interesting, fantastic man called Kapil Tiwari. He said, you must meet Prahladji. And he arranged for me to get, we didn't have, he didn't have a phone. He didn't even have a landline. You had to send a message to um, Shakti STD and Maxi and hope that he might get it. Anyway, we got together for a few hours and I was completely hooked. I was completely enchanted by this music 
I'd been studying Kabir poetry for some time. Uh, I recognized it as the Kabir that I knew, but it was also a profoundly new experience to, ex to feel it as a living, embodied song tradition coming to me body to body from these singers. And it was also just beautiful and joyful. So I said, okay, I'm coming back. So I did. The first chapter tells the story of Prehladji, who is a very special case of many hundreds of people who sing Kabir in the villages in that region. It was a very popular thing to have mandlis in the villages, not to become a performing artist, but some of them who were very good singers did become performing artists. So that tells about his history and introduces the mm, Kabir singing traditions, that is the, trans the oral transmission of Kabir through song. Uh, the second chapter takes up how we think about transmission of Kabir texts. Now, up until now, maybe most of us who are involved in university studies have only read Kabir in books, right? Is that true? So that was the case with me. Though I'd been in India a lot, I've heard people sing some bhajans, but basically it was reading. So the question of how texts get transmitted was a very interesting one to me. If I talk about oral traditions, there's always an interest in the relation between the oral and the written tradition. That which is flowing along like a river and, that, and, and constantly being brought forth by living bodies and that which is fixed in a book or there, there's some canon. And of course, we, we can talk about the process of can, canonization. There are some Kabir texts which are considered the Kabir canon. And we can, I could, you know, some of you may know what those are, and I can also tell you. But in that chapter, I try to understand the, the difference and the relationship between oral transmission of texts and written transmission of texts. Um, and I try to illustrate the fluidity that occurs in oral transmission. And we can imagine that the fluidity that we observe today among singers who know hundreds of songs, you know, these people are not necessarily, they're not very well educated in many cases. Sometimes they're not even literate. They know hundreds of songs and they can talk about them and they can explicate them. Some of them are educated, you know, there's every level. but. Uh, the way in which texts change, like I traced that, all the different ways in which a singer may change a text, all the different reasons why the text might change, from just hearing, hearing differently when somebody else sang it, to forgetting the ver words, or transposing the order of the verses, or sometimes there are ideological reasons. Like one singer uh, didn't like the constant invocation of Ram. He thought that was too Vaishnav and too sectarian, so he just changed it to Nam. And it worked perfectly in the metrically, so people can change things in the oral transmission. So I really studied the way in which texts change and how that can help us understand the way in which written texts have come down to us. Then chapter three was adventures in authenticity. So Hindi may authenticity kya hai? Pramanic. So people were always asking me, lekin Pramanic kya hai Kabir mein? Asli Kabir kya hai? They assume that there has to be a, a, a yes, good, that there has to be a, some real Kabir amidst all, because we knew that some of the versions of Kabir were modern, there was no doubt about it. You hear about the Banduk, and you hear about the rail kit ticket, and you hear about all these things. So people knew that the things have been added in modernity. So they said, what's Pramanic? But the problem is, you can't really answer that. Um, so I discussed in this chapter, um, adventures in authenticity, different discourses of authenticity. If you do it from the viewpoint of those who study old manuscripts, if you do it from the viewpoint of those who study uh, folklore traditions, or from the viewpoint of people in the tradition who ha whose ideas of the authentic are very different. So that's what that chapter is about. In the Jewelers Bazaar, Mawas Kabir is just one collection of one repertoire 
in the early 2000s, like a sort of overview of what was being sung in Malwa in the, you know, early part of the 21st century. This is one repertoire. I tried to present it and, and also show how it came forth when singers were singing it. Uh, fifth chapter is the only one where I got theoretical, had to satisfy the academic world. Um, but it was also necessary because I'm talking about oral traditions and the word orality is kind of trendy, you know, orality. It's like a different way of thinking about things. It's been trendy since the mid 20th century, but what is it? What do we mean by that? I found out it was actually a really difficult study. And as I was telling Theroux earlier today, I wrote and rewrote that chapter about eight times and had advice from well-meaning friends that maybe I should just leave it out, you know, it was not really going so well. But I wasn't willing to leave it out because it's very important to consider what we mean by orality. Um, I really, if you're gonna, it's a long book, so, if you're going to just look at selections of it, I highly recommend that you look at this one called A Scorching Fire, A Cool Pool, uh, also fighting over Kabir's dead body. Because these chapters present the life of discussion and debate about Kabir and his meanings among the regular people in villages and small towns who who hold that tradition, who keep it alive, who sing, who, to whom it's their life, you know? Uh, there's a, there was a fantastic project that was done by an organization called Eklavya, an NGO that's involved in, has anybody heard of Eklavya NGO? They uh, operate mainly in uh, Madhya Pradesh, but they've now all gone into other states as well. They're an educational organization, and they, Actually, speaking about the way uh, bhakti poets get appropriated politically, in the early 1990s, they, the, these people who were based in Hoshangab Hoshangabad? Hoshangabad and Devas and Bhopal, they were looking for what was happening in 1991 politically that was very disturbing. Somebody say that was very disturbing to people who value the ideal of India as a secular democracy. <laughs> huh? What? Babri Masjid. Babri Masjid, right. Mandir Masjid. And then, of course, in December 1992, the Babri Masjid was torn down. And the, the forces that were promoting that Ram Janam Bhumi movement were using Tulsidas in very very effective ways. Uh, so it is another example of appropriating a bhakti poet uh, to promote a political agenda. Of course, uh, I wrote one article about that to like how they used Tulsidas. They used Tulsidas very selectively. They didn't uh, write about Ram as, you know, the, now am I, now I'm not remembering the, things that I absolutely know about. The, the, what are the ways that Karuna Nidhan and, um, you know, the representations of Ram as a, as a friend of the lowly and as a repository of uh, mercy and, and compassion. They were using, the, they were making up new images of Ram as very militant and as a warrior and they were using it selectively. So I say that their use of Tulsidas was not Tulsidas's fault. But Eklavya people, as well as others, were thinking, what would be an organic source, a real source of uh, something that people have a, a great love for, uh, a great devotion to, that would be a voice that would promote something very different, you know, basically a non-communalist, secular democracy, all-encompassing, all tolerant sort of view of Indian society. And of course they thought of Kabir. People are still thinking of Kabir today for that. And rightly so. So they started a project 
Uh, and computer culture was very strong in that region in Malwa. There were hundreds of mandlis would just get together. At the, they would work hard, you know, they were working in the fields, they were chota, they, uh, dukandar and uh, farmers. And they would, at the end of a long work day, they would get together and they would sing for hours and hours into the night. Instead of leaving them very tired, they would come out refreshed. It would give them energy and joy. So this was just part of the culture there. So they began to make friends with the various mandlis and they began to see what can we do with them and how can we join forces with them, learn from them, and bring forth the, the power and value of the voice of Kabir in these times. So they started something called Kabir Bhajan Evam Vichar Manch. And they had monthly gatherings of Kabir Mandlis where they invited people, they stayed and sang all night, they all had chai for everybody, excuse me. And they sang and sang, but they tried to innovate in this way. They tried to convince them that it was besides the joy of singing. And any of you who have tried it, any of you who have spent like a couple of hours singing, you know how energizing and wonderful that is for you. So besides the joy of singing, they, they tried to bring forth some discussion some vichar, and they wanted them to reflect. If Kabir says something about, hey Pandit, you know, dekahu man me vichara, you know, think about, look in your own heart and think about it. And then to very sharply question the Pandit's idea of chuachut, something like that. They would ask them to reflect on that, or ask them to reflect on the language of equality, uh, and not only the, you know, instead of saying Hindu-Muslim unity or, uh, it was more than that, it was a Hindu or Muslim dharm or mazahab ki tika, tiki alochana karna, right? He, he was a very sharp critic of both of them and tried to push people beyond that narrow sectarianism. So the Eklavya Manch tried to encourage people to start discussing, what, how does this manifest itself in our lives, in our villages, in our schools, in our families? And gradually they got interested and, the, and the, the discussion got very rich. And they, who had so much knowledge of this body of material, it was in their bodies and minds, <clears throat> they came forth with their own explanations of the meanings of Kabir and the, and the way they, we could see it in our life around us and the relation between Bahar and Bahar and Peter, you know? And it was a f great project. And they kept uh, extensive documentation uh, on it. And so when I got there, I wasn't there for that, but when I got there, you many of you will have heard of Nambar Singh, the great uh, Hindi, a writer and critic who had recently passed away. He was the one who told me when I met him in Europe, if you want to look at Kabir oral traditions, you must go meet these Eklavya people. They are doing something <coughs> wonderful in Madhya Pradesh. So that's how I got to them. And they did uh, open up all of this, the audio tapes, the journals, the, the diaries that they kept very carefully. So I was able to bring forth the voices of those people, their understandings of Kabir, their understandings of society in relation to Kabir, their understandings of inner and outer meanings. It's, it's just great. I'm saying it's great, not because it's my chapter and I wrote it, but because it came available to me, this most wonderful material. So I really recommend that. The Fighting Over Kabir's Dead Body is a really interesting kind of eth ethnographic article on, it's really a classic case of the what one, you know, sort of theorist of religion called the institutionalization of charisma, right? You have a charismatic figure. He may be very, very iconoclastic and against organized religion and everything, but they will, if he's very great, they'll institutionalize him and set him up as a Sadhguru and as an avatar, and they'll have lots of rituals, even though he criticized rituals. And um, so you have, 
it unfolded on the ground among our friends, this argument over the Kabir Pant, with all of its hierarchies and rituals and so on, and authority structure, and the actual teaching of Kabir. It was a big controversy. And uh, it became a especially sharp controversy because our dear friend and my Rakhi Bhai, uh, Prahlad Singh Tipania, after being quite a radical critic of the Kabir Pant and of hierarchy, decided to become a Mahant. So this was very shocking and it was a big issue. So right on the ground, we could really examine this kind of debate that takes place in the history of religions among our friends. And so that's what, fighting over Kabir's dead body refers to one of the most popular legends about Kabir, which you may have heard. When he died, you're, you're very expressive, right? You go yes, you go no with your head. So what happened? In his, what hap when, he, when Kabir died, what happened in the, according to the legend? Huh? Yeah, yeah, the Hindus and Muslims who were sitting around and saying, oh, he's so great, we want to be with him always, he's our guru. As soon as he died, the Hindus and Muslims, according to this story, uh, start fighting. Should we bury him or should we burn him? And then a miracle occurred, his body turns to flowers, and so they divide it up, and the Hindus burn the flowers, and the Muslims bury the flowers. But there's obviously a didactic point to this story. Very same story is actually told about Guru Nanak. But anyway, um, so that's where the title comes from. There were still fighting over Kabir's dead body, and in Malwa, around the early 2000s, we were witnessing a big fight over Kabir's dead body, like who was Kabir, who has the right to claim the story of Kabir, who has the right to take authority in the name of Kabir, and it unfolded in front of us, right in front of our eyes. Very interesting. Uh, there's also, you should know about Shabnam Birmani's uh, films, uh, 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 which you will find online, and um, you know, if you want to know about it, I'll tell you where to find it. But one of them is devoted to this story. It's called Kabira Kara Bazar Me, and it takes up this same uh, debate, heated debate that took place that we witnessed. Uh, finally, this last chapter, spirit, uh, political spiritual Kabir, I kind of let myself go, and I wander here and there. I, I go, you know, village, city, U.S., India, taking up this question of. Uh, the real tension between political and spiritual orientations and ways of being in the world. So that's the um, summary of the contents of the book. I've almost used up my half hour, or my 40 minutes, haven't I? I've got a bunch more slides. Should I, but see what comes next. Yeah. You know, this is something about orality, but let's just look at point two. Poets and texts are constructed by people. In oral traditions, we can see that process in action. The study of texts becomes also the study of contexts and social formations within which texts are performed. That means getting close to the people who animate those contexts. So basically, in studying oral traditions, I found myself having to be it, it's a study with and of people, and I, I recommend it, you know, I recommend it to you. Any text that you're studying, if it's a living text, of course, if you're studying history or political theory, it may be difficult, but to, if it's a literary text, you can do it. How does it live inside people's minds and bodies? How do they feel it? How does it animate them? That was a question I was interested in. Uh, next one. Yeah, this, just quickly, Instead of just talking about oral and written, which would be what we would usually do, that dichotomy, I realized that we're talking about media, all media. Uh, and every time the medium changes, the text and the life of the text changes. So the first medium is human body. That's Kabir spouting off in Benares, and people listening to him, and other people carrying it on orally. Uh, Next is pen and paper, uh, that is the manuscript tradition. So handwriting. And then when we have manuscripts, it doesn't mean that the physical human body transmission stops, then we have both. Then we get print. Doesn't mean that the previous one stops, but they all have a, a more complex relationship. 
print and oral transmission refer to each other. The singer, the singer said to me in Chhattisgarh, uh, I said, uh, d d where did you learn that bhajan? Did you learn it from another singer? He said, no, no, I got it from a book. I would only take something that's authentically written in a book. So all of these different media um, get more and more, get connected to each other in more and more complex ways. Then magnetic tape, that means audio cassettes. The advent of audio cassettes in uh, Madhya Pradesh tremendously changed the lives of the singers that I knew there, particularly Prahlad Singh Tipanya. He became known all over. So that medium was very powerful. Then we go to film, uh, CD. Then we go to mobile film and the internet. And in all of these ways now, Kabir texts are moving and circulating and none of them has disappeared. So I just wanted to remind us all that it's not just about discussing oral and written. It's about discussing the relationships of all kinds of media and how texts move among them. You can see that once you have people ex uh, exchanging budgets on their, on their mobile, it's a totally different reach of the, of the text. And people who would never have gotten that text and would never have gotten that melody are now getting it and sharing it and using it and so on. Next one. Oh yeah, there's me having fun with Prahlad Tipania in his village. Um, I'm just saying that when you're sitting there and living with the singer and he is a living, walking repository, treasury of Kabir, it's really different. It's worth a try. Look, don't I seem to be having fun? Actually, I'm, I'm arguing with him and he's as usual, not paying attention, just eating his lunch. Uh, okay, Age. Uh, this is Shabnam Birmani. Has anybody seen her, her films? I highly recommend the films that she has made. The series is called Journeys with Kabir. You will find it online on a website called ajabshaher.org. Uh, A-J-A-B-S-H-A-H-A-R. That means wondrous city. All of these titles are words from Kabir Bhajans. Uh, she learned singing from him and then she learned singing from many other people and now she's become a concert singer. And we've worked together a lot. In fact, even though she wasn't intending this, she made a series of four full-length documentaries plus a couple of shorter videos. And we started traveling together. We were interested in the same things and we had fun together. She wasn't intending this, but she made me a featured speaker. I mean, uh, she made me the co-star of one of the films. So I was so excited to become a, a film personality. So sometimes people meet me and say, I saw you in a movie. OK, Age. Anything else? Huh? OK, we won't do this. I, this is a more detailed thing about how texts change. Let's just go on. Uh, no, never mind, go on. OK, so this is a little video. Um, I don't know if we have time. It's a beautiful little scene from one of the films. Um, now I'm going, now I'm definite. So is this a video? Let's, does it play? Yeah, we can play it. Um, no, let, let me just get your advice as to what to do, because I shouldn't go more. I shouldn't go more than. Let's see if technically we are equipped to play it, because I doubt. Oh, no, I can show you how it can play. There's, a, there's an arrow there that you can, there's a play button that you can. Yeah. It should be down here. Can you put your yeah. cursor there? Huh? Somewhere here? Just press it, no? I have a well, that might settle whether we watch it or not, if we can't yeah, play it. Right. Acha, you don't have an audio? There, there, there. No, no. Uh, OK, so maybe we can't play it. Um, that settles it, because I'm going. OK, well, what, what about that? What, what about that? Down there, there was a little on button. That, the, how about that one? <laughs> But is this, yeah. d does this play audio? Let's see. Never mind. I, you can get this online. It's a beautiful little uh, clip 
uh, from one of these films, uh, if you're at all interested in Kabir, in the oral tradition, in the interfaces between Kabir, uh, text and music, and social and political questions, um, you should take a look at these films. There's beautiful music in the films, as well as really wonderful film work. Um, is that all that's in the thing? Is there another one after? Oh, OK. So actually, um, this, is a, this is a sign from that it, our destiny is to wind up this talk. Uh, <laughs> because you know, once a person gets started talking about their own work, they could go on forever. But is there, a, is there any, is the next one, um, the next one, the text uh, uh, window isn't there? Or has it completely given up? Okay, never mind. Then maybe it's time to finish the uh, talk. It's not exactly an elegant finish, <laughs> but uh, since the PowerPoint has died, right? It's died. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we can. Uh, you want to open up for discussion? Yeah. Uh, Can I take this off or do you, do do I, let's just yeah. yeah. Let's see who's are you how many of this? Are you no, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come. So uh, who are you all? Are you clinical science students or you must be thinking this isn't about political science. Why are we here? I don't know. But does any of this relate to anything you're interested in? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a, yeah, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Uh. What? Okay. Ma'am, if we talk about the earlier times, what happened is that or, uh, like oral tradition was the, was the basic notion of truth. But after the imperial, like after the arrival of imperialism, what happened is that the uh, this this tradition changed and this this tradition changed completely. And what happened is that uh, yeah, separate what them. separate them. What happened is that uh, the written text got legitimized more. Like they had more authentic authenticity. And today also we see that our legal system is based more uh, like moreover on the uh, written text and the oral tradition declined. So what do you uh, like? How do you see this journey of the oral tradition and has it declined? OK, so um, uh, what do you think about the claim that the oral tradition went down when imperialism <coughs> came in and the written tradition the, became hegemonic? Is that is that the way history went? No. No. Why? Because the print media itself developed then in India at least. Uh, but uh, when you look at village societies, they were actually even now they do practice yeah. oral traditions. So writing was going on before the the colonial period. Uh, is that what you were saying? I mean, uh, and also print. Uh, yeah, there was there was uh, increased uh, shift in print uh, tradition. Huh. But uh, that doesn't mean that uh, the oral tradition itself, which was uh, mostly in village societies, it continued. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, but uh, the, my claim is that the uh, written tradition was considered more authentic and more legitimate that's than right. the than the oral tradition. That's, that is what that's I'm correct. Yeah. Uh, that is true. Yeah. And uh, the. The influence of foreign colonials yeah. was definitely definitely pushed in that direction, but Indians before the British came or before any anybody came from Europe were recording, were writing, were very invested in writing manuscripts. However, the manuscripts did not have the same uh, place in the culture as then print culture did, and the power. You're, you're, so you're right about that. But manuscripts uh, of Kabir exist from the 1570s. And these, of course, are purely coming out of Indian um, groups, usually some sectarian groups, including the Guru Granth Sahib and the uh, Rajasthani Dadu Panthis, are the most important collectors of Kabir, going all the way back to the 1570s. 
Uh, but actually, yeah, the first person who spoke was right, that in the colonial period, the prestige of that kind of uh, literacy and that kind of elite reading and writing did um, discourage or mute the power of the oral tradition. Uh, first of all, thank you, ma'am, for presentation. Uh, I ask uh, about three questions to you because I'm working on, I'm used to working on Kabi, so that's why I am uh, used to ask three questions to you. First of all, uh, it's related to Kabir identity. Who was the Kabir? Who was Kabir? Yes, ma'am. Uh, second one, what's your op uh, opinion, uh, opinion on critique of Brahminical thought of Kabir? And third Brahminical one- Brahminical thought? Yes, ma'am. Or you, okay. Uh, third one is, uh, is there any relevance of libera liberation theolo theology to Kabir? Okay, you got three or four hours here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it would be nice if I, if I could pull a discussion out of you, but I don't know if I'd be very good at, at uh, leading that. I'm sure you have ideas about that. The question who was Kabir, of course, is a big question, but I'll just say something briefly. Um, we have practically no documented knowledge, no verifiable knowledge of who was Kabir. There's, gen there's widespread agreement that uh, he lived in the 15th century in Benares. Nobody disagrees about that. Uh, some, you disagree. <laughs> no, 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 no. Huh? Let me finish yeah, yeah, this. Can we do one thing? Because I'll finish it. He asked a very generic kind of a question. Let's take a bunch of other questions also, then maybe, you know. So take a few questions and then. Yeah, yeah. All right, because this one has already got my mind spinning with <laughs> his three about, questions. Yeah. I, well, I'll just say some, a, a, a little more about what you said. So we know that. Uh, we know that he grew up in a family of Muslim Julahas, weavers. Uh, other than that, we have no verifiable in information and we can trace over history, over the, a century or two, the growth of popular Kabir legends. So, you know, was he actually the baby of a Brahmin widow who was set afloat on a lake or was he, you know. Those are the only things that everybody agrees upon. That's your first question. Your second question was about the Brahminical. <laughs> anyway, you, some of you will know that uh, there's been a rising in the 20th century, a rising consciousness of, of the kind of barely conscious or barely acknowledged, a sort of upper caste or Brahminical um, mindset in writing about literature. So uh, some, there was one, are you thinking of Dharamvir? Yes. yes, so there was one, uh, I don't know, was he, is he a Dalit or OBC or anyway, he's somebody who considers himself not upper caste. And he wrote a book called Kabir Ke Alochak, where he heavily criticized some of the giants of Hindi literary criticism, including um, Hari Prasad, Hari, Prasad. Hazari Prasad Duvedi. I've actually met him, I can't believe I messed up his name. Hazari Prasad Duvedi and um, uh, Shamsundar Shukla, Ash Asham, God. Ne, Ra, Ra. Yeah, you know. Okay. So um, uh, he criticized them for casting a Brahminical frame of mind over Kabir. I won't go into details of how they, how he saw that in them, but uh, um, he was calling for a sort of voices from below to be the exegetes of Kabir rather than the voices of above, from above. Also, there was controversy about the, his supposed guru, Ramananda. The, part of the legends are that he was a disciple of a Hindu guru, Ramananda. So part of his critique was that you're just bra trying to Brahma. You you're saying that if he was a Muslim and if he was a low caste, uh, he, he could never have been that great unless he had a Brahmin guru. So that was also criticized. Fine. Let's criticize that. <laughs> but it raises very important further questions about who has a right to speak about Kabir. You know, uh, do you have to be, can only a Dalit speak about Kabir? C can only, I mean, the, this kind of identity related authority is a very important one for everybody to think about in all fields of, of 
history and literary studies, I think. So was that all? <laughs> That's enough, right? You asked something else, but. Yes, uh, liberation theology. No, let, don't, let's not talk about liberation theology. Liberation theology is a good subject, which I won't be t talking about. Yellow. Uh, thank you, Saru, sir, for, OK. Uh, first of all, thank you, Saro, sir, for inviting Professor Hess to be in our department. Otherwise, we have the domination of the Indian politics and other th thinkers. <laughs> so, ma'am, before asking my question, uh, I think you are aware of the two Dohas of the Kavir. The Doha. Yeah. 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 It's, it's just echoing a little bit. I'm having yeah. the okay. mic. Okay. I mean, before asking my question, uh, I would like to say two Dohas. Then I'll ask Thank my question. Dohas. Yeah. The, I mean, the... Even if we, if we, I, what I my I have the re, read the Kabir in, since my childhood, you know, yes, yes. in the, my school education. There's huh? two prominent I think which I have observed huh? the reading of the Kabir. Huh? There's the first you made the you know presentation of political Kabir and the spiritual Kabir. Huh? So the proverb the I mean, two Doha which is the first is the ki, what Kabir said, ki kankar pathar jodi ke masjid liyo banaye ta upar chad mulla bang diyo kya bahra hua khudaye. He critiquing the orthodoxy of Islam. And the, I mean, he's saying that uh, uh, you build a um, uh, mosque to, uh, through the concrete wall, and on that wall, you are shouting, is it your God is depth? Yeah. depth. Yeah. Yeah. And other hand, he's saying that you get a lot of money, you get a lot of money, you get a lot of money, if I worship the, uh, I mean the stone, stone yeah. I mean, what, I would you? Worship a mountain. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right, right. Huh? So if we can see the, we the both, uh, both, yeah, Hindu is orthodoxy Hinduism and the orthodoxy Islam at the same time. Huh. So my question ki, how can we distinguish the Kabir being a political Kabir and the spiritual Kabir? And the second thing we talk about the appropriation of the Bhakti poet, especially we can uh, we see the the Bhakti tradition, Radas. Kabir and all, I mean, the, the poet who belong from the subaltern background, especially marginalized background, they have never been portrayed in the main traditions like Tulsi Das, Balmiki. And Tulsi Das, Balmiki is always used by and as a, as, a, as a political mobilizing force by the Brahminical forces like BGP and others. But Kabir. Balmiki is subaltern? Balmiki belongs to the uh, 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 kind of. Uh, which is a very own, uh, lower communities. Yeah. Balmiki became a Muni. Even yeah. Even yeah. That's why the Balmiki community is still uh, worship the Balmiki. So my question is, how can we distinguish the political Kabir and the spiritual Kabir? Why do we need to distinguish? Why don't we see him, in, see his political voice, see his spiritual voice, see how they may relate, and. Uh, Appreciate the richness of that whole picture. So, is the, I mean, the last presentation there was written political, oblique, yeah. spiritual kabi. So, I mean, I would like to, I mean, just elaborate the political yeah. and spiritual kabi. We'll take a bunch of questions, Linda. So, Sanjeev. Yeah. So, just, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The others, yeah. can we, we see how we have some more so questions? Far, yeah. I haven't seen any yeah. women up here. One, two. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, Idraja. Uh, come here. Uh, come here. Uh. Okay, so uh, my question is, uh, is that, not this, uh, okay. So uh, my question is that, uh, you have uh, uh, visited Eklavya and uh, Adivasi Kala Manch. I have been also there for some other works. Uh, you have also a tradition, emerging tradition of Ravidasiyas yes. there. So Ravidasiyas are also emerging. Uh, that is one. Uh, my question is that through these songs, uh, 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 what was your purpose in the book? Uh, is, uh, was it about uh, uh, finding out how, uh, uh, how uh, uh, what is the oral tradition of a Kabi's song uh, that has uh, spread across the context and uh, practiced by the people? Or were, uh, were, we, uh, were you also interested about how these songs were actually getting translated into the, uh, the, the philosophy of these songs were actually getting translated into, the, into their lives. Both. Because they, yeah. I was interested in both. 
Okay. Okay. So, uh, so uh, can you explain a little bit about how Eklavya and uh, and uh, other NGOs they are actually trying to find out how uh, the lives of the people who are actually uh, practicing these songs uh, got transformed? Because mostly uh, this, uh, these songs were uh, are performed in the evenings, and the rhythm. So, so what is important? The meaning or the rhythm? And if both, then how? The meaning or the rhythm, rhythm did you rhythm, say? Rhythm. Because they, they, they perform more on the rhythm. Are you, do you want to expand on it? I think... What are you saying? No, no. I mean, I, I pr presented this question, this, your question, yeah. and I said that in this chapter there's a lot of information about that, <laughs> like how they inquired into whether their lives were transformed or not, or uh, I mean, sometimes they found that they recognized some rather revolutionary ideas, but in their lives it was very difficult to change their circumstances. So it's, there's not just one answer, but I, I did my best in that, it's all gone, I did my best in that, say, that chapter about the Eight Love You Munch to show what they did learn from these people in their own words. So read it. <laughs> I don't know if that's enough. No, huh. Okay, you're next. Ma'am, <coughs> uh, uh, I was going through some of your uh, videos and uh, I wanted to learn about your work and what, what you've been doing. I was going through some of your videos and uh, in one video, something that intrigued me was you used three words you associated with Kabir and they are uh, Shunya, Shabda, and uh, Sehaj, Sehaj sir oh, addressed a little bit. Yes, and uh, I was wondering what Shabda and Shunya mean because uh, with, with regard to Shabda, I was, I was, my mind went to Shabda Prama and in Indian philosophy, which is a source of knowledge. Uh, so does it draw from that? And could you speak a little about Shunya as well? I was so uh, this is somebody who's actually seen that film that, in which I appeared. Um, I appeared alongside of that singer where Shabnam Birmani decided to explore the cross-cultural voice of Kabir. And she started out in Lunyakeri village with that singer and you know, started opening up the world of that rural Kabir bhajan. And then she said, so I'm going, oh, oh yeah, you know in Kabir's songs, you often hear about the desh, that country, you know, um, May Pardeshi, Ham Pardeshi Panchi He Baba, Ini Deshara Nahim, Ini Deshara Kalog Acheta. So I'm not from this country, I'm from another country. So that word Desh comes up often. So she starts out, what is Kabir's Desh? I found some friends. And then after 10 or so minutes of showing Prahlad Tipani in his village, you see the car going through some tunnel, and then all of a sudden she's at Stanford University and says, what am I doing here? Then she comes and shows me, and then she eventually brings us together. So you're, uh, what's your name? Devahuti. Yeah, yeah, Devhuti has saw me. She actually showed me giving a lecture on Kabir at Stanford University. So those three <coughs> words were written on the board. Uh, Shabd, what was the first one? Shunya. Shunya, Shabd, and Sahaj. Sahaj. Actually, this is rather difficult stuff. I mean, but let me try to do a sound bite. These are all words which Kabir and others in the tradition use to indicate a, an experience and a quality of experience that is very different from, the norm, from what we're normally used to, and an, and an opening and awakening of mind and uh, consciousness throughout the body that is very different from our ordinary consciousness. So shunya, you know what it means, it means empty, emptiness, or zero, comes down to us mostly through Buddhism, where shunyata was described in Buddhist traditions as, a, as, an, as the space of freedom from attachment to all the constructed forms that we like to believe are permanent. When we see through the, the, to the flux and impermanence of everything, we experience what is sometimes called shunyata, emptiness, but it, it's not empty in the negative sense. It's actually 
an opening of ability to be free and to see things in much more in their reality because we're free of all of our deluded constructs, including those of our own ego self. So shunyata. Shabd, you said you've studied some of the tradition of the meaning of the word shabd in, uh, in religious text, right? Or, so shabd means word, but also in some traditions it means the word beyond words. It means the ultimate vibration. It means like anhad nad, the unstruck or boundless sound. And it also comes down through yoga traditions as an indication of an experience where you go beyond the limits, the boundaries of your small self. And then, uh, what was the third one? So, uh, sahaj. So, sahaj. so these are all words that point a sign to something that is actually beyond words, they say, and yet they write poetry. So one of the things Kabir's poetry does is say, Mukse kahyona jai, this can't be said out of your mouth, this can't be said in words. However, he has composed like countless poems. Sometimes he said, you know, ishara kya, sen kya, or ya sadguru ne amolya sen diya, some sign. And, or they'll do some trick in the poem to make you, to trick you out of your normal state of mind. And then what you discover is sometimes called a state of mind which is called sahaj. It's very simple, it's natural, it's spontaneous, it's not all these complications, it's beyond all of these rituals and pilgrimages, it's just sahaj. It, if you clear away the stuff, then you might experience sahaj, you might experience what is shunya. They're kind of could be synonyms and they're used in different poetic contexts. Or sometimes you might call it anhadnad and you'll hear a beautiful bhajan that says, you know, anhad baja baje shaher me brahmanda me awaza hui, something like that. So the shaher is your body. So this un, anhad instrument of the anhadnad is playing in your own body and it resonates. <coughs> throughout the whole universe. These are all words to take us beyond our narrow experience of ourself. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I was uh, wondering that you have talked about the oral, uh, oral tradition of Kabi. And I was, I was also wondering whether there's a continue, I'm sorry. But there's a continued written tradition of Kabir where people are trying to write in the literary style of Kabir. And if they are, would we say it is the Kabir tradition? Are they continuing in the Kabir tradition? Or would it mean that they have to fulfill certain criteria to sort of be in that tradition? Yeah. And also the second question is that uh, even in the oral tradition, I was, uh, like for instance in your presentation, I didn't see any women who were like performing or anything. So like what is the presence of women in the oral tradition, either as audience or as performers or... <coughs> Thank you. So if, if the written collections of Kabir keep growing, <coughs> you know, from a few hundred to a few thousand, <coughs> you, you know that over the centuries people have been adding to it. Okay, okay. just combine this, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, if we were really in the spirit of the oral tradition, we would throw this thing away, right? Say, what you get right now is what you get. Anyway, um, so people have, have composed uh, poems or bhajans in the spirit of Kabir or what they consider to be in the style of Kabir and they've added Kahi Kabir. Um, and they do that with a kind of feeling that they're part of the tradition and that this is honoring Kabir. Why should they put their own name on it? There's one funny um, citation that's in one of the chapters of my book. I just loved it. I saw it in another documentary film where this guy, his name is Shankar Lal, he's in another village. And he says, you know, we were singing this song and it said something about the, um, I think it was the, the, the white swan has gone and the uh, crow has arrived. Now what that means is that no, the crow has gone and the swan has arrived. It means old age has come, the black hair has turned to white. But he said people won't understand that, really. 
but it was actually not that line, but it was another one like that. He said, people listening to us sing won't understand that line. So we changed it, something that they could understand. And he told me what the substituted line was. And he said, and then after that I say kahe kabir, and it's all kabir's responsibility, not mine. So it's conscious freedom to alter the text. Uh, so it's just very fascinating to study the dynamics of the oral tradition. Right now, after all of this immersion in living, flowing, fluid traditions, and which change from place to place, right? I was in Malwa, they were speaking Malwi, but then if I had gone to Kabir's area, they'd be speaking Bhojpuri, they'd be singing a different style, they'd be singing in Rajasthani, they'd be singing in, not only Madhya Pradesh has different dialects, you know, Bundeli or whatever. So it just changes, you know, depending on the ground it's growing out of. So it's just fascinating to study. After immersing myself in all that in one area, I've gotten involved in a project to translate one of the earliest manuscripts from around 400 years ago. So now I get to see, you know, some of the continuities. Some of the songs they're singing now, you can kind of recognize in that 400-year-old uh, manuscript. Sometimes you can just recognize a metaphor in two lines. Sometimes, but you can see that, that there's continuity and there's fluidity. So, I don't know if you were asking me whether it's okay for somebody to write something and then call it Kabir's. Yeah, it's okay with me. Uh, you asked something else, but I forget what it was. On the women's... Uh, oh, yeah, women. Yeah, so the thing is, I was really, really loving Kabir, and that's the where I wanted to work. It turns out that the Kabir singing tradition, at least in the region where I worked, was almost entirely male. People told me that the women, you know, Kabir has a kind of a strong, uh, direct voice. So somebody said, oh, women like other kinds of bhajans better, you know, Krishna and all that. I don't know if that's it. But almost all the mandalis are all male. But in this group that went through the Eklavya Kabir Manch, some people took an interest in training women to be Kabir singers. So they kind of nurtured up some Kabir, women Kabir singers. But on the whole, it's mostly, uh, it's almost all men. And in the village performances, there are always women there, but fewer. Why? They're the ones who have to do all the work and take care of all the children. The men can sit till one o'clock in the morning and enjoy the pageants. The women actually have more home responsibility. They do come. There, there are many women who come. Uh, uh, thank you, ma'am, for a wonderful presentation you gave. Uh, ma'am, I have a, actually, I belong from a village of a Magadh region of India. Magadh, Magadh region. And there's a little influence of the Kabir Panth. And then uh, I, I read about uh, the Kabir that uh, mostly he has picked uh, in the domain of uh, uh, Social, social, and the religious, uh, spiritual. We can say ah. spiritual domain. Uh, he uh, he did not speak out uh, especially. Uh, uh, partially addressed my question that he, he did not uh, speak about uh, the women's and he he if he uh, speak he uh, discriminate to the women uh, somehow. And uh, is it was the his political compuls compulsion? Uh, of that contemporary time, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a political compulsion. I mean, I have to say, he, he wanted to somehow to politically correct. You mean about women? Is it what the things he said about women? Yeah, yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, um, even with all my love of the oral tradition, I've never, I've, I still haven't gotten the talent that many of my Indian friends have to just remember, just have it in my memory. So I wish I could. Uh, yeah, I'm still just too conditioned for the written word. So if I could, I would recite some of these kind of awful dohas where Kabir says awful things about women, you know, or Maya, Sarpani, Dakini, you know, <laughs> Kanchan, Kamini, that kind of thing. Um, you know, he, he lived in the 15th century and uh, basically all the hegemonic, I mean, all of the cultures and religions of the world 
were grossly sexist um, until sometime in the, I don't know, sometime in the 20th century. <laughs> and that process is still going on. So he had probably the same kind of gender biases that were prevalent in the, in the society. One of my friends in Malwa, one of the most intelligent and sharp and interesting people I worked with there, Narayanji, when we pointed those out to him, he just couldn't bear it. He said, that couldn't have been Kabir. Somebody else must have written that and put it into the tradition. Couldn't have been my Kabir. He didn't want to believe that Kabir had that prejudice against women. But that's not a surprise in any pre-modern uh, male or person, you know. Even Buddhism, which was supposed to be much more egalitarian, started out with that kind of bias. So, yeah, he did it. He wasn't being pol politically correct, but he used woman as a symbol of desire, a temptation, you know, the temptress, the one who, who destroys a man's sadhana, that kind of thing. But not that many of them. You have to kind of search and There's get one them. Question here on okay. the thing. I should just mention, though, that. Uh, uh, Pushottam Agarwal, who is a very well-known uh, writer, literary critic, and scholar of Kabir, has written one essay on the fem feminine voice of Kabir. That is the more um, kind of, it's kind of like the Vaishnav tradition of the woman longing in separation from her beloved. And he believes that Kabir had that ability to take on the woman's voice, and so we can't just dismiss him as biased against women. I actually have a different view of the how to understand those uh, that poetry where the male poet takes on the female persona and speaks of her male beloved. But that is one way of looking at it, that he also valued and took on a female role. But still, it was a stereotypical female role, right, of the woman longing and uh, withering away because she separated from her beloved. Last one. Oh, yeah. The last one, and Shivali has a, has a few, oh, you're to few, stay here. few few dohas. Uh, he wants to narrate a few dohas from Kabir. Just, oh, yeah, great. Just for everyone. Great. Uh, now, my yeah, question is based on the dress sense of Kabir. Like, it's some, like I read in some article that uh, Kabir's dress sense was based on like breaking the binary between the male and the female because his dress sense was not completely male. So that is what I dwell upon, like, uh, like if you could. Uh, so... Um, uh, how do we know what Kabir wore? Uh, did he, uh, do we have him, some photographs from the newspapers of the time? From the first time which we looked at, it was. So actually we, we have no idea what Kabir wore. Um, and there's one nice scene in one of the films where somebody is uh, producing a play. I think it's uh, maybe Bisham Sani's play on Kabir. Okay. And the director of the play says we had a terrible arguments over what, what Kabir should wear. And somebody said he should wear this, but then somebody said no, he couldn't possibly wear that. Nobody knows what he wore. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, Sibari will uh, just. Uh, Hello. Uh, we should give Kabir the last word. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, <coughs> Kabir ke in, matlab, इन दोहों में हम थोड़ी गहरी इंटेंसिटी भी समझेंगे कि किस तरीके से कबीर जो हैं बहुत सरल शब्दों में अपनी बात कह रहे हैं जैसे कि राजा जाने प्रजा जाने जाति कबीर जुलाहा आन देव की सेवा नाही राम भजन का लाहा मतलब ये है कि ये राजा भी जानते हैं और प्रजा भी जानते हैं कि जो कबीर है वो जाति से जुलाहा है या वो किस जाति से है लेकिन इसका मतलब ये नहीं है कि वो किसी की सेवा नहीं कर रहे वो किसी के भक्त नहीं है आन देव की सेवा ना ही मतलब जो सबसे सुप्रीम जो है उसकी वो सेवा नहीं कर रहे हैं राम भजन का लाहा मतलब उसको सिर्फ उस 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 परमात्मा का आसरा है और उसी के वो सहारे हैं वो कहते कि वो ये मे मेरा राम वो दशरथ का पुत्र हां जी वो नहीं है हां जी भाई थोड़ा उनका जो जैसे एक उनका है वो को कहां ढूंढे रे बंदे नहीं तो तेरे पास पे वो लाइन है सर इस पे तो फिलहाल नहीं मिल रहा है जैसे एक बात कर रहे हैं कि वो कह रहे हैं कि हाँ जी करता दीसे कीर्तन ऊंचा कर कर तुंड जाने बूझे कुछ नहीं यो ही अंधा रुंड मतलब ये है कि आप कितने भी कीर्तन कर लो 
है ना और उसको कर कर के आपने अपना कितना मान बढ़ा लिया आपने अपना पेट बढ़ा लिया उसको कर कर के लेकिन इसका मतलब ये नहीं कि आप सब कुछ जानते हैं आप कुछ नहीं जानते हैं आप यूँ ही अंधाधुन मतलब कुछ भी कह रहे हैं और एक और इंटरेस्टिंग जो मुझे लगा है वो काफ़ी अच्छा है कि जैसे पूजा सेवा नेम व्रत गुड़ियन का सा खेल पूजा सेवा नेम व्रत गुड़ियन का सा खेल जब लग पिब बरसे नहीं तब लग संसय मेल मतलब ये है कि बहुत लोगों के लिए पूजा पाठ अर्चना ये सब बहुत दिनचर्या का काम है लेकिन वो कह रहे हैं कि ये सब जो है वो गुड़ियों गुड्डे गुड़ियों का खेल है क्योंकि इसमें जब तक आस लगी रहती है तब तक आप पूजा पाठ करते हैं जब आपकी आस टूट जाती है तब तक आप पूजा पाठ खत्म कर देते हैं तो ये मुझे काफ़ी अच्छा लगा और एक और हम कहते हैं कि नहाए धोए क्या भया जो मन मैल न जाए नहाए धोए क्या भया जो मन मैल न जाए मीन सदा जल में रहे धोए बास न जाए मतलब ये है कि अगर आप नहाते हैं धोते हैं कुछ भी करते हैं लेकिन आपका अगर मन का मैल नहीं गया तो कुछ नहीं गया क्योंकि जैसे मछली जो है वो सारा दिन जल में रहती है लेकिन उसको आप बाहर निकालो उसको कितना भी धो उसके अंदर की गंदगी या उसके अंदर की जो बास है वो जाती नहीं है ये बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग है थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू मैम मजा नहीं आ रहा है बिल्कुल बिकॉज आई थिंक वी आर स्टिल गोइंग इन टू दिस काइंड ऑफ अ मोरलाइजिंग कबीर आई थिंक द मोर एक्साइटिंग कबीर वी स्टार्ट विद दिस थिंग अबाउट द पोलिटिकल यूज ऑफ कबीर और वी वॉन्ट टू गो टू दिस प्योर मिस्टिसिज्म आई थिंक द वे द पोलिटिकल यूज टू विच कबीर इज पुट इज नॉट इवन पोलिटिकल एंड दिस थिंग अबाउट हिंदू मुस्लिम एंड ऑल समन जस्ट टोल्ड मी दैट सर वाई डोंट यू रीड द वन ऑन हिंदू मुस्लिम um i think those are the most obvious uses of kabir you know saying that how he talks about the caste question and says we should all rise above these narrow divisions and all of that i think the more exciting kabir is really the kabir who um breaks with all those uh not just those kind of divides of categories of uch neech and uchi jaat and niche jaat and uh, alag alag dharm and sampraday and all of that but uh goes to uh life lived first hand you know um so um, um uh, you know in your work uh, i was reading the chapter yesterday on the on the from the bijak book and uh, the, the morsia iliad quote you have there uh, i know you wrote that book long time back uh, but i will try to uh provoke your memory <laughs> um uh, where uh marcia iliad he's a great uh, professor of religion i think he lived in india in the 30s and 40s uh and he has written on religion on the theory of the eternal return nietzsche and all of that um where you quote him uh on the sandhya bhasha you know of the uh, sants because they used to use a particular kind of a language where they inverted everything around and as professor linda has argues there that it is not really like just ulad mas is not like just uh, putting it like upside down right because when you say upside down it presupposes that there is a right side up so there is no right side up so uh, you know sometimes you go to a building in some posh uh, area you know building and the ceiling will have mirrors and then you look like this you know and then it feels like ulta ho gaya or when you are kids or generally if you are playful you might do in the bed you might turn around and like look upside down things you know um so this entire turning upside down which does not presuppose a right side up means that there is no finality to the way the world is like this that i am seeing it like this i can as well see you like this in the critical theory uh, lectures we are having recently we were talking about cubist art and all of that where you are like turning around you know pablo picasso will do this crazy drawing or salvador dali will have a picture where the clock which is a round shaped thing with the you know hour hand and the minute hand and all of that that clock is melting uh you know down by the table it's become this kind of elongated thing and you don't know where the hour hand is and second hand it's all become some kind of a thing now all of that i see when i when kabir is saying uh ek achamba dekha re bhai khara siya chalave gai 
right? That how can I, he says, that, oh, I saw this achamba, drishya. Jisme lion is taking a cow for grazing. Or he will say that I saw a fish which is eating a cat. How is it possible? Or he will say, oh, the, um, the son was born first and after that the mother. So he is like, what is he doing? You know, he is taking this life in which there is a particular sequence. And you know, all these uh, critical takes on what is normal, there is nothing called normal, what is this heteronormal thing, we should be queer. I think Kabir goes far beyond that. This entire deconstruction and queer theory and all of that. So in that sense, again, coming back to the women's thing, it's not like he has to actually show a real woman and all that there, you know. But in terms of his approach, he is far more queer than all kinds of queer theories that you have circulating in university departments today. So I think, and the other thing I want to draw your attention to is also where you mention, and uh, I'm just refreshing your memory there, where you mention also the time and space um, um, uh, point, you know, where you're talking in that section, where it's also the spatial uh, reconfiguring that is going on in Kabir's Dohas, right? So, um, 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 uh, even in Figo, but I don't know too many Dohas, I'm not a Kabir specialist or something. But what I see is that even in the one with the Panihari, you know, uh, or in fact, actually Tipanyaji had told me another one uh, when we talked about this Panihari thing, and then he told me there is another one, uh, another Kabir Doha, and he, you know, he remembers so much of it. He says, it, apparently there's a Doha which says that uh, there's, a, uh, there's a bird uh, and which is feeding its little ones up on the tree and uh, the, the little baby birds are hungry. So it has to go and fetch worms or insects or little things, you know. So, but there is a bigger bird which wants to come and eat up these little baby birds, you know. So there will be an eagle or a vulture, so this might be a pigeon or a crow or something. So the mother bird goes to go and get some food for the babies. But all the time when it is doing that, its mind is here with the babies. So it's kind of away, at the same time not away. Now this kind of a very sophisticated dialectics that Kabir brings on the table, you know. This is what is absolutely fascinating. So I was also, um, say, looking at, say, Sant Ravidas or even Guru Nanak, and whatever little I have seen so far, you know, there's a huge long Sant tradition in India, including Guru Goraknath and everybody else, or Dadu, Paltu, you have, uh, you know, Namdev, you have Tukaram from Maharashtra, the entire Abhanga tradition, which is, I think, connected with women uh, from Maharashtra, but I somehow see this kind of sophistication only in Kabir. And earlier when you were telling me that it, when you got Kabir, you knew that this is it. You're going to stay with Kabir. So I think there's something about Kabir there. I mean, it's great for us to today raise questions. Okay, was Kabir ecological? Was Kabir queer friendly? Was Kabir women friendly? But I think that's not the way to go about it, you know. Uh, so I think when it really comes to uh, Kabir's basic kind of where he's taking us, let's say, you know. That's what really fascinates me. It's a journey on which he takes you. And he's a mystic, but he's a mystic who takes you away to only bring you back into this world, you know. So the nirvana and the samsara kind of coexistence, you know, that is the Sahaj Bhav, you know, that is Kabir. And, and that completely fascinates me. So I was looking for actually those kind of dohas, but so if you, some of you, if you have it, Sivari, you still uh, can go ahead with Let's, that. We, we have to end this. You've been very, you know, you've endured such a long time here. Thank you. Um, just when you were speaking, it just reminded me to say that Kabir um, is constantly urging us to connect with ourselves to understand our own nature, to understand the nature of our own mind. He has many wonderful dohas that show a great psychological kind of sharp insight, like how the mind works. And he's, he sees all of us as 
just walking through the world with so many delusions and so many pretensions and so such a kind of <coughs> fragile but complicated ego structure that we carry around with us and bump into other people's ego structures. So he really, you know, what is the line that everybody knows, what is the word that everybody knows in a Kabir song? Kahe Kabir? Suno. He is addressing every one of us. Suno. He's not a talking to God. Yeah. He's talking to us. Exactly. And he's asking you to, and all of us, to examine ourselves, to examine our pretensions, to examine the nature of our mind. This Ulat Bansi that Saroj was talking about is a, is a profound sort of dip into like the nature of the mind and how we actually have to break through the bonds and the constrictions and the delusions of our own mind in order to get some broader wisdom and insight. So he really is telling us, there's one, again, I won't get it right, but just say something may ag. What's the uh, flint may ag? There's something, just say blank may ag, hey? Just say, kya? Dude may gav, meaning ghi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then it's the next line is, the ram, gut gut may ram, hey, jag sake to jag. So, I'll the ghat is the, is the body, right? The ghat, ghat is yeah. the constant word for the body, this clay pot, which is your body. Yeah. There's so, many, so much interesting poetry about the body and what you can experience in the body. But anyway, just keep that phrase with you, jag saketo jag. Kabir is inviting us all to wake up to much deeper self-understanding and through that, <coughs> a much better understanding of the world that we live in. Thank you for staying so long. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>